Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. We love their sponsorship. Thank you, guys. We have a treat for you today, and it just happened to happen this way. We are going to revisit two of our favorite podcasts, but we're going to do it all in one. We are bringing you a little bit of a best of. Now, many of you know them as Tyrus and Timpf. Tyrus, that's his name. It's just Tyrus. And Cat Timpf. Together, they are on Gutfeld. Together, they have a podcast on uh, the Fox platform, Fox Nation. And they were part of my first two weeks of podcasts here. So on Sideline Sanity. I thought what we'd do is give you the best chunks of each of them to revisit. So we've cut them down a little bit. We're bringing you the good stuff. All of it was good. When Tyrus cried, it was great. You might get to hear that again. Really interesting people. So without further ado, this is a special episode of Sideline Sanity featuring Tyrus and Tim. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. So I met Tyrus for the first time when I was on the Gutfeld show and he was so kind to me and he really showed a a great deal of respect. And I just appreciated that so much. He played football in college and wanted to play in the NFL, wanted to play some pro, ended up becoming a WWE wrestler. But it was such a pleasure to talk to him on my podcast within the first week of unveiling Sideline Sanity. Tyrus joined us. We had some serious issues and some not serious issues to discuss. Here's a look back. His name is Tyrus. The book is just Tyrus. Here's what I need to know, though. So what is your what was your name at birth? So, OK, that is a great question. <laughs> uh, it actually changed twice. When I was born, I was too big, believe that or not, (laughs) uh, for my mother's 15-year-old frame body. So they had to get uh, the, well, they're salad prongs. There's no other way to describe them. (laughs) I I understand. So they had to squeeze them on my head to pull me out. And I got a little dimple from the prong mark, right? It's still there? It's still there, right there. Aww. So when I came, and the problem was they got my head out. I had these traps already. (laughs) So just when she thought it was over, they had to turn me sideways to get me out. Oh, my God. So when the nurse, they take you and they hand you to the nurse, and the nurse nurse said, my God, he looks like Hercules. So they were trying to convince my mother uh, that they should name me Hercules. They're like, look at him. Like, he's just a monster. Like, he's cute. I mean, babies are ugly. Let's just be honest. But I Not all of uh, them. No, when they first come out, the smush well, head. Oh, yeah, not, that's true. The smush. Okay, it, it, fine. It takes, a minute. it takes a minute. But she was saying that he was a, a cute version of Hercules. And uh, uh, But my uh, biological father was set on me being junior, just based off the physical attributes coming out. Okay. I was, uh, I think I was 22 and a half inches. I was uh, 10 pounds. I was a big Ouch. Boy. And uh, so it was George T. Clement Jr., and what was the T for? Uh, Timothy. Okay. okay. So that's what I was. Uh, that was my namesake. He was. He was a junior. I was like, technically, I guess, a third. But right. Um, he, you know, uh, weird. He'd be bad with math along with parenting. So uh, George T. Clements Jr. was what I started out as, okay. and uh, that was what I was most of my childhood until I started playing sports. Okay. And I got to uh, Mount Gleason Junior High School, and I was trying out for their, I think it was the basketball team. And it was like a, it was like an intramural basketball team. And then it was like, um, 
And they're like, what do you want to be called? Like, and I was just registering the school and I was signing up for sports and stuff. And I just thought that it would be rude to have that name on the back of my jersey. Because... My mother, because of my mother and because of what she went through. And her last name was Murdoch. And I was with her and I wasn't with them. So I lied to the school intendant and said, my name is George T. Murdoch. What's the T stand for? And I said, T. That's it. <laughs> so, and um, so it stuck. And when I got to high school and stuff, my mom just never really, she just said, okay, son, that's what you want to do. Yeah. And there was, there was always this fear in the back of her mind that he was looking for me. That your like dad, your biological that, dad was looking she for She always you. had that fear because sometimes you attach your own integrities to villains. Whereas he wasn't giving a, a rat's ass about me and my brother at that point. He was living whatever world that he was into. But in her mind, she was thinking, what would she do? And she would be searching for us. So there was always that fear. And as I started to get recognized for sports and uh I won my uh, ninth grade talent contest. I did a stand up. I did steal a little bit from Richard Pryor. I have to admit that. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, the, no one watched the videos, so I got away with it. But um, I started to get notoriety in, in locally and stuff. So uh, being a Murdoch, one was an homage to my mother for trying and being there, and it just stuck. I, high school, college. And it wasn't until like my senior year in college when I was getting ready for graduation and stuff, one of the boosters said, hey, that's not your legal name. And I said, so it is my name. <laughs> so and then they, you know, there was an issue with the school and then the, basically the dean said, how long have you been George Murdoch? And I said, since I was uh, 11. He was like, then you're still you're George Murdoch. And then yeah. some law, one of my buddies was a, a pre law mate. He's like, you're allowed two aliases in this country. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, cool, man. Thanks. So I never wanted to carry that name. Um, and I think rightfully so. But uh, in the book, I talk a lot about, uh, especially in the acknowledgments where I talk about learning to forgive him mm -hmm. and myself uh, for a long time, that burning anger, the, the defiance of uh, that's not my namesake and things like that. It does affect you. It, your fuse is shorter, especially in sports where I had all the talent in the world, but the, the knock on me was I wasn't mentally tough. I would get aggressive. I could be easily taken out of my game. Okay. So or, it, when, when they say mentally it. tough meant that you reacted sort of without control rather if, than if a coach criticized me. Yeah. I would be defiant. Okay. I could not handle tough coaching. Okay. Like, and because I didn't, I looked at any time, uh, especially a, a white man, which 90% of my coaches, they were not their fault. But whenever an older white man barked at me, it was rejection from my grandfather. It was abuse okay. from my stepfather. So it was, and I would always like, I was the guy you wanted to play next to because I always had something smart to say about the coach. <laughs> you know, but that doesn't help you get picked in the snow bowls and senior bowls yeah. when, you know, he's, he's a, he's a great ball. He's a, you know, I remember coach Morris who, um, my offensive line coach at, uh, UNK, he used to say, I'd be getting taken out to lunch by every NFL scout in America. If you would just keep your head in the game. And I like lunches. I love to go to lunch. I especially like my lunches to be paid for. You know, all you got to do is stay low and shut up and you'll be playing this game for as long as you want to. And even that, which was a compliment, I took he was hating on me because I was black. Really? You try to figure that out. But I had my I had my escape and my issues. And a lot of that had to do with my anger towards being abandoned. Right. So I wouldn't allow anyone to abandon me. I wouldn't invest any connections or roots with anyone like when football games was over. I went to my dorm room. I didn't go to the parties. Right. I didn't. I was the most socialist guy on the field. Same thing with with performing. When I'm on the stage and I'm doing my thing, I'm the life of the party. I make everyone laugh. Right. When the show's over, I go back to my room. I'm well, quiet. I have a theory about the what the reason you liked to make people laugh too. It's because when you were eating those peppers in front of your mom and making yes. her laugh, that was one of the 
the biggest accomplishments you felt as a little tiny little boy that yeah, you were able to make sad. make her laugh. Yeah, my mother was always sad. Yeah. Um, she was scared. She was scared to death. And people don't. And I I I didn't think it was necessary to go into a lot of the specifics in the book. I think everyone got the general idea. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, I still have to protect her, and, and it's still her story. I told my part of it, but I don't believe in telling other people's stories. And there's a few times in the book, like when I had my stupid run where I thought I was going to be the next Scarface because I didn't want to work hard anymore, uh, yeah. where I write, this is where my story ends. Yeah. Because I had that voice in my head that was like, don't do this anymore. And when that, I don't even know, remember her name is, but when her smart ass called me a drug dealer in front of everybody, it it like woke me up and it was like, this is not what, you know, I'd rather be broke. Quite and it's frankly. interesting that that came from a girl. And I'm just yeah. wondering because y y your mom, did you, did you have your mom on a pedestal or were you more just protecting her? What, what was your, no, she was on a pedestal. It was, okay. a, it was an unhealthy relationship in the fact that I looked at, like I could give her everything she needed. And again, that's not from, that's from a child's yeah. perspective. Yeah. I don't know anything about, adult stuff. I just know, why would you need a boyfriend when I'm there and my brother's there? Why would you need a husband? Like we're here. Like we had no, no concept of, right. you know, and so that for me, it was like my mother was my everything because she came back from me. And the other side of it was, I was a constant reminder of the monster that she survived. I look exactly like my biological father. He's mm -hmm. darker than me but I look exactly like him. So it's uncanny, except he's just, I'm just a lighter version of him. Is he as big as you? No, no, that I, Lou Ferrigno did that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I swear, I mean, my, my, my family biologically, genetically, I think the closest one to me is like six, two. And you're um, six, eight, right? Because I was at four years old, I was watching, the Incredible Hulk when it came on, I think it came on Sundays or something like that. And I just, every time that uh, David Banner would change, I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change. And then I'm going to whoop, you know, he's not going to hit my mom anymore. And I would tell him, I'm going to get big one day and you're, you're going to regret it. And I, Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry, which isn't very threatening from a four-year-old. But, <laughs> but, so but to me, I, I, but to me, I thought it, it, it was. And, um, Sometimes TV being the babysitter can be a good thing. I was just lucky that I grew up in a generation where every TV show, the message was the good guys win. Yeah. The yeah. method was morality in every TV show. Yeah. It was yeah. never, and everything was kind of filled. It was like, if you do the right thing, good things happen. Yeah. You do the wrong thing, bad things happen. And it's that. Not like, not like you grew up watching The Sopranos or Breaking Bad right, or something like that. Yeah. Right. Where the villain and I, some of it's there's there's two guys who ruin good guys and that's Darth Vader and Stone Cold Steve Austin. They ruin <laughs> they ruin good guys across the board. Like oh. it, it's their fault uh, because Vader was cool. Yeah. Nobody wanted a Luke Skywalker action figure. You wanted Vader absolutely, and, and he was a deadbeat dad, and you know he was a horrible person. But because he breathed through a mask, which ironically we all ended up breathing. For a while, uh, <laughs> we were all Darth Vader for a while. You know, hey, let me and ask I you. I I need to ask you this because it wasn't clear to me in the book, and I hope I didn't miss it. And if you can't answer it, then don't. But when was the last time you saw your biological dad, father? I've seen him twice, and um, the last time I saw him, I was having trying to understand him. Uh, I flew out to Sacramento, California to meet him. I had workouts in uh, California. I was trying to get on with the San Diego Chargers. And uh, I was being financed by this by this guy named Julius Bouvet, who was uh, an entrepreneur, let's say that, who was financing uh, financing a semi-pro team that was paying you more than the Arena Football League was. Wow. So there was no reason to play Arena Football if I could play 11 on the field and stay in shape for when that call was going to happen, because we all think that call is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, every year you're away, away from it is 10 years. So, um, And we had a game up there, and 
I forget. I always my problem is there's always somebody with the nicest intentions who's trying to connect me to somebody because I'm a lone wolf and they're always trying to connect me. And somehow they did research and they, the Clements thing and they looked it up and they reached out to, I think it was Facebook or some, I don't remember what it was. It was, I think it was before Facebook. It was way, way before, but anyways, they got in contact with them and they invited them, him and his new wife to the game. And I remember sitting there with Cornelius who was, he played for George Allen at Long Beach state and he had become like a big brother to me. He had me bouncing all the clubs with him and, um, um, fortunately, unfortunately, the constructs of the book, they made me take a lot of, I wrote like 370 pages and they made me take a lot of stuff out and okay. Cornelius will be in my next book. But, okay. uh, and I was sitting on the sideline cause we all line when we sit together, we don't associate with the others as I would call them. I would say like, you too pretty to be over here. Go over there, go over there. <laughs> like there's no mirror over here. And, um, I hear someone yelling, that's my firstborn, that's my firstborn. And I turn and look at this ridiculous dude in a poncho with like a, a, a hat off to the side. And I'm and I remember Corn goes, Man, that dude looks just like you. And I was like, What? And I'm looking, going, Oh my God. So you didn't know he had been invited. No, I didn't even know that he had been invited. I still to this day don't even know how they read how the 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 booster or the the it was like the assistant GM for this uh, semi pro team. That's how legit put together they had it yeah um and i didn't when we were leaving he was at the stands like waving like hey and i just kept walking really yeah and um i could hear him yelling what were you feeling in your gut at that moment sheer embarrassment really i was embarrassed for him and i felt absolutely nothing i was just, why did you come here? <laughs> like, that's what I thought. And as I stopped, I went to go back to confront him. And I remember Cornelius going, you don't owe him nothing. So let's go, man. And we left. And then it happened again in the WWE. Um, he showed up in Boston at the TD Garden. And he had went to Will Call and said that Brodus Clay's father's here. And that I should have left tickets for him. Brodus so Clay he, being your your stage name, name there, yeah. yeah. For and, people who aren't up to yeah. speed yet. And uh, when the guy came up to me, and I'm I'm friend, I'm not. I don't hang out with the GMs. I don't hang out. I hang out with the equipment managers. I hang out with the guys behind the scenes. That's my crew. That's where I live. That's where you know those are my buddies, and the trainers and stuff. And the the guy who does our tickets came up to me and goes. Did, I'm sorry, did I make a mistake? Did I miss something? Was I supposed to leave tickets for your father? And I said, my father? What the hell are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, there's a guy here with uh, four people saying that they're, he's your father. And I said, what? And I said, yeah, he's over there. And I said, well, let's take the walk because I just thought it was like some fan or something, you know. And then when I stopped, I saw him and then I was like, no, nah, tell him how much are tickets? And he was like, we're sold out. Then that's what you tell him. You know, and then uh, my sisters who because uh, he has like 17 other children, right. um, reached out to me on Facebook and they said, you know, he came to see you. He's pr so proud of you because they don't know him like I know him. And he loves to see you dance. And I said, the only way he'll ever see me dance is I'll come to his grave and dance on it. So, I had a feeling you were going to say that. Yeah, and I, I won't I won't disrespect your show with the rest of my language, but it was colorful. And basically him and the horse he rode in on and anybody who's down with him can go so I didn't speak to my siblings after that because you have a gross misunderstanding of the monster that you have around you. Right. And how how can you not be supportive for your mother? Because I guarantee you it didn't end well. And I never I never communicated with them again. But I never gave him the opportunity for amends because there was no reason for it. You cannot undo what you've done. And the book is a lot. Of, you can go forward. And that's what I did. Once I forgave myself for letting letting him control me, even though he was not a part of my life, the anger for him affected me and hurt me in a, a lot of opportunities in life. It also gave me a desire to prove him wrong. So it was like a double edged sword. Yeah. But once I was good with me, there was no reason to reach out to him. And I did when, not care for his answers. When did you finally click? I'm good with me. I mean, when, I had, when I had my son. Really? When I had my son, uh, when my son was born, it's like my daughters are different. 
in a way that like I worry about my daughters every minute of every day and I still don't have the ability to say no to my daughter. <laughs> so I mean Roblox cards like I mean I every time like my daughter Georgie uh, every time my wife sees Georgie going to the store with me she'll be like do not give her anything. <laughs> And, and then let me guess. She, we come home, Georgie's like, look what daddy bought me. And da, 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 da. And because she knows <laughs> as soon as she goes, daddy, I really need this. And I'm like, you know, you're not. Well, uh, all right, man, just one thing. Just one thing. <laughs> and then it's just, that's me and my daughters. Like, you know, and the same thing with Nala. Every time Nala's like, dad, I really need this. Uh, you know, so I'm like, I'm on Amazon. Consider it done. You know, uh, yeah, and yeah. where my son, everything's, you got to earn everything, son. Yeah. yeah. But. When he was born and I was holding him and I was traveling and seeing him and seeing his uh, sister, I would think to myself when I was wrestling in Europe and I didn't, and he couldn't talk yet, but if I didn't get a daily video of what my kids were doing that day, I was in a bad mood. Yeah. And I thought to myself, this dude never went through any of that. Like he never did any of that yeah. because he didn't want me. And why the hell am I angry at a guy who didn't want me? I don't know him. And I'm like, look at all the joy that he's missing out on. Like it was his loss, not my loss. And so once you, there's two ways it can go. Cause I've seen the other side of it where you just, aren't, friends of mine just weren't able to connect to their kids because they still were fighting. They were still a kid themselves fighting themselves. But once the first time you hear daddy, the first time my daughter walked to me when I came home, uh, the first time they watched, they pretended to be wrestlers or when now when they do talk show interviews and <laughs> do their own podcast, which some of them need work, but they, <laughs> I love my kids. Uh, but that joy, um, he didn't get any of that. Yeah. So I, I don't even feel sorry for him. It's like, and you, I realized that I can't get any of that back if I was to miss all that. And he can't either. And he doesn't deserve to get the finished product because he wasn't, he didn't help mold it. He didn't help make me. And no. so that's why I said to him, I did it without you, yeah. with other men. Um, it took a village. It took mistakes, you know. And so we're good. We don't know each other and we're never going to know each other. And I'm good with that. So it, it just... Kids do that to you. Yes. Well, they do a lot of things to you. That's, yeah. There's no question, especially when you do when want you show them up. and you show up. And uh, I, in reading the book, I, I just it all made sense to me uh, because you are someone that I would call an overcomer. There are people who are born into bad situations and they, they don't know. They aren't equipped somehow. Maybe it's because they don't get the influences you did. Maybe it's because they don't have the brain that you have. It's, I'm sure it's a combination. There are so many dynamics that go into this. But you overcame so much. I, that's why I just want everyone to read this book, Just Tyrus, because it, it explains so much, of, not just about you, but about how you can do this. I, to me, it's like... Give this to every young kid in America, because no matter what their situation is, they can see there's a roadmap. And for you, it was do the right thing. Even when you sometimes made the wrong decisions, you yeah. ultimately found your way out of that. And, that's the thing is, is, and not to cut you off, we have a, a spe I can remember hopelessness is a, an ugly addiction. So when something's happening to you, especially when you're young, you don't see that there's a time limit. Like when I was getting hit, for example, when my stepfather punched me in the stomach and I couldn't breathe and I was on the ground and I was coughing up whatever I ate and I was in horrible pain. And then, and, and he would go sit, go smoke a cigarette, whatever. During that time, I didn't think it would ever end. And there was never going to be a way out. And so you, you, can feel yourself submitting, just giving in. And as my brother would say, if you didn't stand up to him, he wouldn't hit you. 
And I remember looking at him going, but I got up. And when I stood up and brushed myself off and wiped my tears off, I would tell myself, the next time he hits me, I'm not going to cry this time. And I would keep telling myself that, like, you are not going to beat me because I'm going to get bigger. There's going to be tomorrow. You know, the, the sun comes up, you got a new day and it's a new chance. And the mistakes I made of not telling anybody was because I was, I was like, I'm going to beat you. But... I don't recommend that. I believe, especially now, when the the power of telling, you know, because we were taught when I was growing up, tattletale and, yeah. you know, snitches get stitches and all that. When you tell on a, somebody, a parent, when they do the wrong, we live in a world now where everyone will take notice. Yeah. And when someone puts hands on you, you speak on it. But I didn't. Uh, and that wasn't just the, culturally, it just wasn't the way it was. But whenever I got knocked down, and I don't know if it was... Muhammad Ali, watching Muhammad Ali videos or, or whatever the case may be, every time I got knocked down, uh, I, my first move was get up. It just get up. He's I'm not going to give it to him. And sometimes I got hit again, you know, because I would he would hit me and I would hit the ground and I would get up. And sometimes I'd even say stupid things like that's all you got. Yeah. But he would frustrate him and frustrate him. And I, again, I don't recommend it, but in me, it was just, I'm getting stronger. I'm work. I'm getting smarter. I'm going to read every book in this house. Like I'm going to, I'm going to beat you in every aspect of everything. So I just, I figured that there was, if I learned everything, if I toughened up that I would beat this. And eventually once you realize that there is a tomorrow, it's not so hopeless anymore like he's getting tired it's getting harder for him and that aspect as twisted as that sounds i was winning and i'll never forget the day that he slapped me my mom had got a we they were moving for they were moving to palmdale california and they had this new house and my brother had met some friends and they were running and we were playing tag i think we we're playing uh capture the flag or something and my brother was running from the kids and they ran through the house and they had dirt in their hands. And my brother like was on the wall. So there was handprints all over the wall and he ran outside. And what, and when they came home, they saw the mud on the wall and they were livid. You know, it's a brand new house. And, you, yeah. duh, duh, duh. and I looked at my brother and I winked at him and I said, sorry, my bad. And they didn't. And Craig didn't like that type of language. He didn't like black talk, as he would say. And he walked over to me and he smacked me. Now, usually when he would smack me, my head would go to the side and I'd crumble. But this time when he smacked me, it was like, and I was sitting when he smacked me. As I stood up at that moment, I realized I'm taller than this dude. <laughs> and normally it would have been a slap, left, right, whatever. He stepped back. And he did something he never did before. He looked at my mom and he was like, you better do something with your son. Oh. And as I turned and looked to my brother and I looked to my brother, my brother was like, don't do it. And I looked to my mother and my mother just said, she said, George, please, please sit down. She knew it was coming. She knew that it was only a matter of time. But I had at that point, he was no longer a threat. Now, I was lucky that I had sports and friends and I had heroes and I was, you know, I worked hard. And so, but you have to put in that kind of work. Not everyone's going to be 6'6". Six, six. No, or, you know, they're not. Or 6'8". Yeah, or 6'8". <laughs> at, at that time, I would think I was 6'6". Six, six. But the point is, is, though, even if you're 5'2", courage makes you bigger. And you can fight through it. And maybe you don't beat him up. But you do call the police. You do tell your school teacher. You do, you fight him in the best lane that is best for you. You know, if you're a little girl and someone keeps touching on you, you tell. You don't, whatever threat they give you is not worse than what they're doing to you right now. And once you learn that their window, because that's what abusers do, they make you, they try to put you in this bubble to where everything goes through them. There's, you don't breathe without them. You don't eat without them. And you can't reach out to anyone without them knowing. And that's how they control you. That's when you realize it's just a bubble. And as soon as you reach through it, it pops and their power is gone. Suddenly things are a lot easier. And um, 
that to me is the message because I, I don't, my story is my story, but my troubles are our troubles. Yeah. We all have scars. Every one of us has had someone hate us for some reason or the other. We've had horrible things happen to us. And the difference between those who make it and those who don't are the ones who lie in it and the ones who don't, you know, and the ones who stand up. And sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do is to stand up and, so, and telling and talking. You always hear kids like, well, he said he was going to do this to my, he's not going to do anything to your family because he's doing it to you because he can't do it to people in your family. Right. right. There's, like I said, there's, there's monsters, but that was my biggest thing is once I realized that there, he was, Craig was not the universe and that there were things better than bigger than him. And that's what gave me, I think that's what gave me strength and the, the ability to get through it. And once just, I got through it, I was like, I'm good. It's some, it's, it's a remarkable story. It really is. And it encourages the key word there. What's interesting to me before I let you wrap. And I, 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 I can't, encourage people enough to read this book for so many reasons. It's terribly entertaining too. You'll laugh. You'll it's, it's you, terrific. You have to laugh sometimes. You have, you, you, you have, to. have to. And that's why the people in this world who want to shut down all kinds of comedy are, are sad, soulless people, but yeah, that's another story for yeah, another day. They're, Tyrus. They're, they're, they're deep. But so you're, I realize you have your story. Your mom has hers. Your brother has his, but I was curious you and your brother, same biological makeup you turned out or at least you approached this issue maybe because you were older he was younger very differently are you still the two of you very different yeah we are um i did a good good bad job as my brother's parent because kids can't raise kids mm -hmm. and i always took the fight for him I never allowed him thinking I was doing the right thing right. to learn to fight. So he was different. He found ways to avoid things. And we fundamentally just don't see things the same way. Yeah. Um, he hates me. I don't write about him. We don't talk. The last time I saw him, he wiped out my bank account when I was in WWE. So I had to say goodbye. And the last time I spoke to my brother, I told him I loved him. I did the best I could, but I can't know him anymore. And, um, we're both better now. Uh, when I think on it, I get sad that you'll never know my kids. Uh, we'll never be together. Like I, I just, one of the things that in writing this book, I realized that sometimes it's okay to say goodbye. Sometimes just because your blood doesn't mean you're supposed to be together. Right. My mother has a good life. Uh, my brother has a good life, but when we're together, it's mangled and twisted and there's just some scars you can't heal from. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes the most responsible thing to do is say goodbye. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, but I just can't know him anymore. I am sorry about that. At the same time, I am in such admiration of you being able to make some very, very, very difficult decisions from the time you were born, really, from the time you were four years old, hoping to take your dad out so he, he didn't could, couldn't hurt your mom yeah, anymore. I, I probably should have realized what TV was about back then. I didn't know <laughs> burnt doubles and probably should have researched that a little more, but I would like to argue I was four. So You were yeah. just four. I can't even... Life life lessons. Learn yeah. very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> This Tires. TV stuff might be fake, yeah. Oh well, you know. Anyway, I, I'm you've left me at a bit of a loss. I'm emotional for you and with you, but I, I it's I, all if, it's closure. Yeah, 
sometimes it's still painful in a good way because if mm. I didn't care, what does it say about me? And then I can shed a tear at the process of saying goodbye, but I don't regret saying goodbye. We are all better apart. Yeah. There's some things you just can't, and I guarantee to kind of bring everything back together, the families that were torn apart from what happened yesterday, some of them will have to be apart. Yeah. Because they just can't relive it every day together. No. Yeah, it's and so in, in this aspect, and I was very respectful of my family. Because even though we don't know each other, they're still my family. Yeah. So I don't think I said one cross word about no. my brother or my mother. Uh, really, book. honestly, it, it's the way you approached it all is is has great restraint, beautiful restraint. This is not a bitter book. This is a no. journey. And I'm not a victim. No. And I love you for that. Uh, that's why this is so exemplary because it's so easy to, as you said, you called it hopelessness, a, a, an awful addiction that you can fall into this sense of, I got no, I got no power. I got no control. I have nothing to save myself, but we all do. We yeah. need to find it and we need to teach kids to find it. I, I, parents teach your kids to find their power. You're, you're raising adults. You're not raising babies. They are no. babies when they start, but you are raising humans. Make you them can't strong. You be their friend, and no. I, I'm, I'm I'm cool, and but I'm not my kids' friends, and I have to tell them all the time, like <laughs> I'm not your friend. I'm the one that's going to ground you. I'm yeah. going to take all the stuff I bought you away yeah. because I want what's best for you. And they yeah. get mad at me, and like you know, they'll tell me my TV show's stupid, and <laughs> <laughs> nobody wears a hat on TV but you, Dad. Is it because your hair is spotty? <laughs> so, you know, it's, hey, they fire on me. I mean, they're around me, so they got to learn the, the, the quick wit. But I, I think your kids are are so lucky that you're their dad. I, I genuinely mean that, Tyrus. I think you are an amazing human being. And, folks, when you read this wow. book, you discover the gritty process, the the churning, the, the pain that sometimes that journey requires to becoming a great human yeah, being. Every road's got bumps in it. And if uh, it doesn't, you, somebody did something wrong. Yeah. And, and, and your life really isn't and interesting will, if you don't you have the bumps. Be, yeah, no. And, and you'll be probably not a good person. Right. Right. God, I could talk to you for hours, Tyrus. I hope we have more opportunities oh, uh, to see each other. Anytime to be on the with you and, and uh, you got me a little bit. You Dana Perino me. Oh, uh, Dana really try to get me the tissue box, but. You know, like I said, I first questioned, like, why would she leave sports? She's a guru. You know, like you, Linda Cohn, are like two, like I consider the goats. You oh, know? gosh. And, and um, I got more then, to say. I got more to you, say. You do. And then when you do your interviews, I'm like, oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> there you go. I answered my ask a question. You're going to get an answer. Sometimes you might not like the answer. But you got me all choked up and stuff. So uh, saw the world's biggest lip quiver. Uh, uh, it, it funny though, when you get emotional, because I'm looking at the camera when I start, I'm like, you will not, don't you dare. <laughs> and, and, you know, we'll lay that. She'll be like, she'll slide a box of tissues and be like, we're going to name this dog Tyrus. Like she would go, you know, and then lean yeah. in to try to get a reaction out of me. So uh, you I'll have to let So Dana you're know. used to I, it. You got yeah, it. I, I'm, usually, hey. I'm usually one step ahead of Dana. I'll, <laughs> I'll immediately crack a joke, a preemptive joke, but you, you caught me. You got me. So I, I got lulled into your, your journalistic. Oh, trap. it's my, my little web. My, yeah. yes. Hey so, man. Yeah. I, don't, I don't quit your J job kid. You, uh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, congratulations on the book. People read this book. It is so worth Again, it's it's beautiful because it's a quick read. It, you won't be able to put it down. It, there's we didn't even touch the Snoop Dogg stuff. We didn't. No. There's so much. And um, so listen, I uh, nothing but respect. Thank you, Thank so, you so, so much, much for all this time. And I'll hopefully I'll see you again in New York. That anytime, would be man. Yeah. All right. Anytime. The great Tyrus, everyone. Well, it is crazy world out there in every sense of the word, but especially when it comes to finances, the, the the economy, inflation, there's a war going on that affects all of it, right? Supply chains, gas prices, 
energy prices. We're about to, oh my gosh, we're about to maybe have to choose how much gas do I want to put in the car and how much do I want to use to heat my home because I've got to pay that bill too. These are not great times. And not only do you have to think about the short-term decisions, you got to think long-term as well. Here's a good long-term play for you. Silver and gold. Gold is a hedge against inflation. It also protects against a weakening dollar. Now we get bombarded with ads about silver and gold and where you can purchase it. I'd like to recommend Legacy Precious Metals. They're the only company I trust when investing in gold and silver. You can find them at LegacyPMInvestments.com. Now you might want to start working on this soon. If you remember 2008, those who invested in gold saw huge gains while others simply lost their retirements. So why don't you give them a call? Just ask some questions. They've got people who can talk to you, IRA experts. Here's the number, 866-528-1903. 866-528-1903. They've also got a free investor's guide that you can download at their website, LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com. Check them out. Well, Kat Timpf is also one of the regular co-hosts of Gutfeld's show in Late Night on Fox News Channel. And I got to know Kat when I visited there and have gotten to know her, go, gotten to know her even more since. And she's just such an interesting human. She really is. She's had a crazy background. I mean, there were times when she was homeless and she's real, she's just got a quirky sense of humor that is interesting and funny and smart. And so without further ado, here's a little bit of our interview with Kat Timpf in the early days of Sideline Sanity when she joined us. All right, Kat, so I'm in the carpool lane and I'm driving up to pick up my daughter who's 13. My son is 16. And the, there's a gentleman who does like security at the school and kind of helps organize stuff and and he starts walking over to my car and I'm thinking, uh oh, what am I doing? Am I texting while driving? Am I in trouble? And I am looking at him and he's like, roll down yeah. your window. So I rolled down my window and he said, oh gosh, I, I hesitate to say this part, but I'm going to say it. He goes, you were much funnier on Gutfeld than you were on The View. And I said, <laughs> I said thanks. And he goes, that cat, Tim, she's funny. Now <laughs> it was just funny to me because I know people think you're funny. I know that already, but here's this guy that I've known for, I don't know, 15 years or so and known him peripherally. I don't know a lot about him, but learned that not only does he watch Gutfeld, but he kind of has a crush on you. So I thought that was very sweet. And I didn't tell him that I was going to interview you today because he might've gotten in the car and come home with me. And I didn't think (laughs) that was a a good idea either. But what makes you to me unique, and I, I hope that, you know, you're not uncomfortable with people complimenting you to your face, but you don't seem like you're trying hard. Like I did. I remember the first time I worked with you in studio, I say worked with you, but I followed you into the studio and I thought she seems shy or nervous. I don't know which, but that's not how she seems when she sits in that chair and just has a blast with these guys. So how do you explain that sort of disconnect between a person who can be very shy and a person who can just sit there and absorb whatever Greg throws at you and kind of look at him and go, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah, I can actually totally, like, I can actually totally explain that. I mean, I'm a person who, I'm, I'm extremely awkward in a um, normal situation. Like, to me, if you ask, you ask me, like, what sounds more terrifying, giving a speech in front of 5,000 people or making small talk at somebody's baby shower. And I will pick the speech in front of 5,000 people every single time. Uh, I've always been someone who's been a performer. I was really into, you know, I was like a theater kid, but I couldn't sing. So like there were, you know, I I would, you know, do my best. I'd always be like in the background. I love to perform. I love to be in front of people. I don't know what it is, but in that situation, I feel a lot more comfortable than I do in a, any normal like hangout um, situation. I think it's, I make the joke that it's like, oh, my attention seeking behaviors are normal, but I don't know what it is. I think it's because a lot of my, you know, awkwardness or weirdness um, that again was, I was, you know, made fun of a lot in school and, and it doesn't come from nowhere that I can be, you know, people, I did get made fun of 
Uh, but I started in my adulthood to get paid for the exact same thing. <laughs> so like, I, I feel more comfortable in that situation where I, I can be a weirdo and people are going to laugh rather than and and again i started really going back to that you know when i was lived in la and i was really broke and i can i can go into just how broke i was uh you know just let's just one of the worst weeks of my life was when i got i got scabies and the same week my cat got fleas because i was just like, oh, living in squalor it was so itchy it was so horrible oh my god but gosh. that was when i started really getting into performing stand-up comedy because i would get up there and i would just like talk about it i would just say like you know, make these jokes about how my yeah. life was just falling apart and I can make it funny and I can make people laugh. And it was a lot, it gave me a lot of power in that situation rather than, ha you know, a situation where I'm meeting new people and I have to explain like, I'm not sure that you want to come hang out with me at my apartment. <laughs> like, I don't think you want to. It's not, oh, you won't, God. you won't enjoy yourself. So yeah, I mean, I, I just get even, uh, I'll be at like a, a get together, any like formal get together. I'm just sitting there. I'm like wringing my hands. It's like yeah. pleasantries because I'll just be the kind of person who says something really weird because I have, so I, I do, I have a very strange brain, which makes me very good at what I do. And yeah. I know that, but it also makes me a very awkward person at parties. Like I was at a <laughs> party at, um, I don't know if Nancy Rommelman, she's a good friend of mine. She's an amazing journalist. She has these get togethers at her apartment where it's like a super eclectic group of people all the time. She's like in with the reason crowd. But she's also friends with like Leah from Real Housewives. And like, uh. you just never know who you're going to meet there. And so we're there, we're, you know, hanging out. And I'm just sitting there. And all of a sudden, they're like, Kat, what do you think about? It? I'm like, I'm just wondering, like, there's a lot of people here and somebody here is going to be the one to die first. And I wonder who that is. <laughs> and of course, like, everybody. <laughs> And everybody's like, like, get out, like, who, who is this person? Like, get out of, get out, like, like, let's talk to someone else. Oh, but I'm, I'm self-aware. I'm nothing if not self-aware. So I know that it's something that serves me well in front, in a performing sense, but in a social sense, I will say something weird accidentally without even, even realizing it because my brain is just like that. And I also, I do have, um, you know, I have anxiety, I have um, ADHD, I have depression. And again, my ADHD, I've started to see as a gift because my brain going a million miles a minute is helpful in this specific job. But yeah, yeah. in other areas of life, it is not so much. Well, <laughs> like, you it's know been what? I, I can understand that it's been a struggle. Uh, I love that you've overcome all of that and used this stuff to your advantage. But you know what? Mm -hmm. Who needs parties anyway? I mean, if yeah. to me... I, that would have been a fascinating topic. I would have started to look around the room and say, I bet that guy over there is going to yeah, be the first I was like, one to die. Because it's going to be someone. Yeah, it is going to be someone. <laughs> and, and here's how he's going to die, you know? And then start yeah. thinking about that. I mean, to me, that's far more interesting than the usual stuff you talk about at parties. All right, you said something a second ago, a minute ago, whatever, that totally has me picturing the moment. And now that you're happily married, I hope I can ask you this and yes. you can retell it without getting emotional. But you said the guy you thought you were going to marry broke yep. up with you on Coney Island in front of your dad. Yes. He's, what the hell happened there? I got to know this story. Yeah, we've been kind of like fighting a lot. Um, my mom's sudden death was a strain on the relationship. She died of a uh, rare disease called cardiac amyloidosis, where it's your body starts building up a protein that your liver can't break down. So it starts creating it. So it builds up an organ. So hers built up in her heart and it kind of mimics symptoms of other illnesses. Let's just like, she'd had cancer when I was in college. And so they were looking for that. They didn't have that. They're like, okay, it's just like a heart problem. Cause it is really rare. Um, and then once they find out what it is, it's too late. So once she was formally diagnosed, she died, but three weeks after that. Oh. And it was very stressful. And, uh, I was not an easy person to deal with. Um, and I ended up actually telling this story on gut, the gut fell show because this was a devastating, at the time, this was a, just a devastating. So we had been fighting about something. He like saw like a text in my phone he didn't like. And like it wasn't, there was no cheating. It was just like fighting. And um, he, my dad was visiting for Memorial Day weekend. So we were at Coney Island. We were all supposed to meet. He came and he met us. And we'd been still fighting over like the something stupid, but we'd been fighting so much. I had not been easy to be with my dad. We had margaritas. My dad went to go get another round. And while my dad was getting another round, he broke up with me. Oh my and, God. <laughs> and then I, and I was devastated because I was like, there's a lot of emotions that come with, and this is somebody who now, when I had the advice show on vaccination, I had him on, like, we're fine now. 
Um, wow. But at, at the time, yeah, at the, because we're in like, we have a lot of mutual friends and um, it just wasn't, it ended up not being a match. But at the time, you know, you're 26 years old and you're thinking yeah. like, this is the last guy that like will ever be able to meet my mother. And that is a very deeply emotional thing. And um, it was the end of the world to me. And, um, but then I was able to years later, actually, I ended up telling the story on the Gutfeld show where I mentioned as an offhand comment, they ended up to hold the whole story and everyone was <laughs> laughing so hard. And again, getting power of that experience, which was so yeah. traumatic because as I explained on the show, he hung out with us the rest of the day. That, that takes some balls, man. That. I mean, that is unbelievable. Yeah, he hung out the rest of the day. And um, he like sat next to me on the Ferris wheel. He took the train back with us. And my dad was like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever <laughs> experienced. I mean, and especially because like he knew he was going to break up with me when he came there. And uh, I, I just feel like you can it can wait like don't come yeah like, don't yeah. break up with the girl in front of her dad <laughs> especially when he's going to get another round of margaritas and you're planning yeah on like my dad went to get the drinks and this is as i said this on the gavel show like he went to get the drinks he came back to a shit storm like oh my like, gosh. I, like he went he's getting drinks he comes back and like, like it was it was oh you know, my it, gosh it's funny now and um my husband it's like it, it's like it, I, it's been easy which uh, like I've had all these relationships that have not been easy. And this has been, yeah. I I'm like, oh, this is kind of what people are talking about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's when so you know, a, folks, that's yeah. when you know, when there are no red flags and it's yeah. easy. I mean, yeah, it's just totally. I mean, I was, I got to a point where I had so many, but I was very single and I was happily single. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'm on my own and I don't want a boyfriend and yeah. it's too much trouble. And my husband is was not my type. I mean, I always dated musicians. I dated a rapper for a while. I dated comedians, act stuff like that. You know, creative types. Right. And right. my husband is a former army ranger from Westchester who works in finance. So <laughs> it's like <laughs> I didn't want to go out with him. Yeah. And I was on the dating app Raya, and I was at home for Christmas, and I was scrolling through with my sister, and she's the one that like clicked the like on him and I was like he's wearing a lacrosse sweatshirt like that's so repulsive <laughs> and she was like just try it like just try it so I went out with him it was okay he was really into me at first I still wasn't sure I canceled two dates on him and then the third my sister was like one more time but then on the he, he was the second date he came kind of like dressed like in a hoodie and like a hat and I was like oh like he's kind of cute like I and I just he was cute and I um, after that second date we never spent a night apart after that Oh and my gosh. We wound up moving in together after four months of dating. And um, I was somebody who was like, just so not commit, like, just like even the relationships that I was picking, I was like, it's almost as if I was picking them because I was like, I don't want anything serious. I hadn't had like an actual serious relationship really since the Coney Island guy, I mean, I had one guy that was like awful to me. We were on and off, on and off, on and off. And he was like cheating the whole time. And I knew it. like, I don't really count. I mean, th that was a disaster. Yeah. I, um, I've had those. Yeah. Yeah. Like you break up like 60 times and you, yeah. you know, but that was, that, that one doesn't really count as a relationship to me, but this, and, and, and so people were like, cat, like, so we started seeing each other. And then like, after the second date, you know, a week later that we like, you know, made it exclusive, made it official. And then we moved in. All my friends were like, who are you? Like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> but and and they meet my husband and it's we are intrinsically opposites. We yeah. are totally opposites. But um it works so much better. I mean, because he's good at things I'm not good at, I'm good at things he's not good at. And there's just this underlying um, you know, like we, we have shared val a lot of shared values, but right. personalities are different. Um because I, I don't know, like me and another person who's like a creative type, it just always was a disaster. He is so even keeled, which I'm not so much. You know, though it balances you out and it's yep. all those silly little things that people say like opposites attract or ours yeah. my strengths or his weaknesses, yada, yada. It, but it, it seems to make sense once you finally find that. And I, it's, it, it makes me very happy. I'd never heard the Coney Island story before. I'm glad you told it. But yes. I, do re I do remember when you got engaged because something happened at the beginning of the show that never happens, which is they put you on camera, like with your ring, you know? Yeah. And it was sort of like this. And I kind of went, is that, cause I've been, I yeah. just been a fan of the show for so long. I feel kind of dorky. I feel kind of like I'm a geek, but uh, I, I just, I laugh. I like to laugh. I don't like to be lectured at. 
And right. um, I, I like to hear diverse opinions and I don't need, you know, someone singing about vaccines on TV to me. So, no. I, you know, I, I just appreciate the show so much. What's interesting to me, though, too, is that you talk about the stand up comedy part of your life, but you also wrote. And, uh, you yeah. know, how did how did you get into write? It's not easy to get published, Kat. You know that. So when you talk yeah. about you just kind of this throwaway line. Yeah, I wrote for the National Review. It's like, no, that's how, how did that happen? So I was always a, a writer, um, and I mean that in like the truest sense. I mean, I would write for fun when I was little. I I really um, really enjoyed writing. Um, I was you know an English major. I you know had internships where um, like I wrote you know I worked at the Washington Times as an intern the summer after my junior year of college. And I had, you know, some some doubts actually from people at the school of me getting the internship, not because of my writing, but because of my professionalism. You know, I, <laughs> I, I'm weird. I'm not. I'm not. Um. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what the word is for. I'm quirky. I'm strange. You're not cookie cutter. You no, know, I'm business not. Per- yeah, no. Okay. And just me, yes. you know, showing up at the office and what is she going to show up like and what is she going to act, you know, and this is the Washington Times. But I fought for it and I ended up having 10 front page articles in the course of a 10 wow. week internship. So wow. I made a great impression there. So um, then I, when I moved to LA and I had, you know, the internships in the broadcasting and then I ended up getting fired from my job as a traffic reporter because I was giving wrong directions. So like, I totally got it. Like, I, <laughs> Wait, like, where I were totally, you a traffic reporter? Which station? Uh, it was a it was it was a syndicate called Total Traffic Network. So it was like okay. um, uh, KFI traffic. and like all these different. Um, so like I, I was yeah I was in the helicopter and I was like they were like kept me longer than they should have because they thought I had a great radio <laughs> voice which I do yeah you do but they were like dude like you're leading people into traffic like you can't so you know I, that was fair but then I was struggling to know what to do and the Washington Times reached out to me that they had a web editing position um, so and that was there was no writing involved so what I decided to do was just to kind of my whole philosophy is you don't really wait. You can't wait for opportunities. You have to create opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I would just, you know, I got, I applied for this writing fellowship, the Robert Novak uh, fellowship. I got that. I started pitching ideas for pieces to bosses at the Washington times. um, And, you know, writing in my spare time when I was there, I also used to did the same thing. We had a radio station in the building and I show up and I said, Hey, I got some broadcast experience. Why don't I like come on like a couple times a week and do a segment And, um, so I just kind of always wrote and rather than waiting for someone to ask me to write and, um, and then I ended up quitting to take a lower paying job at the leadership Institute campus reform because they wanted to get me on TV. They were like, we're going to TV train you. We're going to get you on TV. So that ended up, you know, obviously working out. Um, but I ended up being pretty good at writing for the internet, you know, in, in terms of, like the little viral, like little click baby yeah. like type stuff. And yeah. I had a friend who worked at National Review and they were kind of looking for somebody who could do that there. So I had three interviews at the at the National Review. And I remember, because they were kind of like, okay, like she's not really like conservative. Like I'm, I'm libertarian, right. but I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not socially conservative at all. Mm-hmm. I'm super non-interventionist in terms of foreign policy. I'm liberal in terms of immigration. I think anybody who wants to come contribute to our economy and who's nonviolent should be free to do so. So, I mean, I had a lot of interviews and I remember I got in a little bit of trouble with the second one, even with, you know, it was Jack Fowler and Rich Lowry, who I, I absolutely love. Right. Um, they were like, okay, so what's your stand up like? I was like, no, it's like fine. And then they like talk to someone. They're like, no, she's like, like naughty jokes basically. And they're like, just tell <laughs> us the truth. I had three interviews and then I had a three month trial period during that three month trial period is when my mom ended up dying. But like right after that, like it was a matter of like not, not it was like right after the trial period, but she started ended up getting sick rather. And uh, it, it was and then but it was just writing, I guess. And and um, really, I mean, I remember the beginning of the National Review. And I would stay late and just if I didn't find anything to write about. I would be there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And then I kind of moved, you know, as I into like, if I had ideas for more serious, longer form pieces, I started to kind of write those. Um, I think 
that writing is something that I just never waited for an opportunity to be able to do. You just did it. It's uh, it's it's quite a career that you've found for yourself. I, I I asked someone this the last time I was there in New York with you all, and and I said to someone leaving that night, you know, you, you probably knew this was gonna pop this show, but did you know it was gonna really do what it's doing ratings wise, popularity? And they said no way. So I'll ask the same to you. What did you think was gonna happen once Gutfeld became a you know nightly? um, show it, rather than just that Saturday gig. I, yeah. I mean, especially because everybody wanted us to fail so badly and you can say you tuned it out, but it's, you don't, I mean, yeah. yeah. Greg gave me the advice for the few, first few months to just not look up, look at it on social media, which I right. followed and he didn't follow his own advice. I don't ah! like that. <laughs> Typical. It was really helpful. Um, I mean, because I mean, we had the first, episode and of course everybody zeroed in on maybe certain things that didn't work and not anything that did and there's also the factor of of course like it's the first one and yeah. like there's always things that need to be worked out but I like I I never imagined I like I thought like people would watch it but I didn't expect to be beating Colbert I know <laughs> like, no, right I didn't expect that at all it's crazy. It's out yeah. like it. I don't. I don't think anybody did. I really don't. I really don't think anybody did. I mean, even when the weekly show started doing those kind of numbers, we were all kind of shocked. Yeah, and which is what obviously propelled it, right? Is that when it, you saw those numbers yeah. and you thought, "Why aren't we doing this every night?" Yeah, it was actually something that they were discussing for quite a while of doing okay. it every night. Um, I think something that people, a, a lot of people, may not realize. I mean, is just how small our staff is. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of, we have, I don't know, we have maybe like 14, 15 people, something like that. And that includes like me, Greg, like Greg's assistant, like Greg has like two, two people who like are writers full time for yeah. the show. And I yeah. write for the show a lot. Like we all wear a lot of hats. And mm -hmm. especially when you think about like Stephen Colbert has what, like 20 people or 30 yeah. people who just write. Yeah. And he has like a costume department. We have yeah. like, a, you know, we'll send an intern out to like party, you know, like party city or party city or whatever the <laughs> Halloween store. And we film everything on iPhones for like sketches. And we'll have like an hour where we'll all write it and film it. And it's um, so I think it's crazy to even like if we weren't beating all these people, I would even say like it would be unfair to even compare us to them because yeah our resources, there's such a huge discrepancy in terms of resources. So that's what makes it even more insane that we are beating them. But what makes it very um, understandable is the charm of that because you see producers and guys that are doing the bits. You you can tell who's not a professional actor in those bits, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's charming. And it's, it's, and clearly no one's taken it so seriously that, you know, that you feel looked down upon. It's, it's rather than sort of this elitist view of the world, it's sort of this common man's view of the world. None of you is common, but you're, you know, it's this, I don't know, this full circle sort of grouping that you have. And all the, it's one of those things. I, I always think about Led Zeppelin. Sorry, I do, because mm -hmm. they're one of my favorite bands and, it's the chemistry. It, it's yeah. Every great band is great because they find this bizarre, rare chemistry that ends up working for it. And I think you guys have found that. And I sure hope it doesn't spoil ever because it is, it's so refreshing. It's so much fun. And, uh, I congratulate you. Um, last thing I want to ask you about I've known Kennedy since 1998. We worked together on the Olympic Games in Nagano. She was brought in as sort of this, you know, oh, she's so edgy, cool, MTV, blah, blah, blah. And we did the opening ceremony together. And I was abysmal. And that's all I remember about it. But mm -hmm. she was the officiant at your, she officiated yep. your wedding, right? Yep. She sure how did. did you choose? How did you choose her? Well, I mean, she just knew us really well. I know she'd done it before for like Guy Benson and his husband. Right. She did. I mean, like she did such a great job. Like she came in, um, you know, over and kind of talked through like, you know, what stands out of our relationship and, and, and those kinds of things. She took it really seriously. Like, what do you guys want? And she did like, 
it's the best to have someone marry you who really knows you guys, like Mm -hmm. not just you individually, but knows you guys as a couple. I mean, when I was dating horrible men and this and that, like I was Kennedy's couch. I was passing out on all upset all the time. And (laughs) so it was like, it was, it was crazy, you know, to have this amazing relationship and have her kind of watch it from the beginning. And I remember one thing that she said when she was marrying us and again, going back to like how, not alike my husband and I are is like she said like this pairing of people proves that love is like it's not an algorithm and um it was just she does such a great job and um she just like took it really seriously you know and I I cried it was she did a great job yeah I mean that's awesome see the guy that married us uh in the Episcopal Church St. Mark's in downtown Minneapolis he was the very Reverend Joel and about six months after we got married, he was kicked out of the church. So we're not sure if we're still really legally married, yeah. but we're hoping so. We're, we're just yeah. going to go with it. You know, we're going to go with it. Not um, sure how that works. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know either. I, I, be, I honestly, never mind. It's too much about <laughs> religion and not enough about what matters, which is, which is love, Cat. Love is the answer. That's what they say. Mm-hmm. All right. She found that really funny. <laughs> hey, yeah. thank you so much for the time. It, it's just of a course. good look into who you are. And I think what people really ought to take away from this is that you embrace everything about yourself. You know, I'm not easily, I'm sure. No. I, you know, and that is a journey through a life. And I just love how you've made this new life for yourself, how you have jeans and Carl and they yes. represent these very two different sides of life for you. And, and so congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for coming on. She is Kat Timph and you can catch Gutfeld. If you don't watch it, why don't you just try, you know, get over the part that less than Kat, before I let you go, the other night you said, when you don't want people to like, you think it's so controversial that you work at Fox news channel. So you just tell them you do porn. Porn. Which you yeah. I think it's less controversial. <laughs> Why it, it, can you, is it still, do you still find this that if people say that you're meeting for the first time, find out you work at Fox news channel, that they're like, you know, taken aback. What is the, what is the thing? It's absurd because people think that like Fox news is one brain, which is just not true. No. I mean, like, you're not, you're going to hear, you know, me, Greg and Tyrus talking about different stuff at 11 PM. Then you're going to hear on Fox and friends weekend, you, right. you know, I mean, there's a lot of different individuals here with different individual beliefs. And it's like, when I tell people I work at Fox, they're like, some people have only seen like certain, you know, things from Fox, like little clips on like right. other late night shows, or they, they heard someone, they go back to something someone else said years ago that was, and it's just like, okay, like, what if you heard me say something that I was like, like, like it's so ridiculous because yeah. I'm such a person who see as an individual and sees others as individuals and evaluates yeah. others as individuals. And a lot of the people who kind of claim to do that, they don't as soon as you say Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, folks. Just get out of that mindset. Burst yes. the bubble. Go watch Gutfeld. It's on at 11 Eastern time, Monday through Friday. Terrific show. Lots of fun amazing talent and um, really fun guests too. So it's been a pleasure talking to you, Kat. I'm glad I know more about you. I'm glad I know the margarita story now. In <laughs> it's just all coming full circle. Great having uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Sideline Sanity. I'm Michelle Tafoya. Thanks for watching. Happy to talk once again with Charles Thorngren, the CEO of Legacy Precious Metals. You know, I think it still is confusing to people, uh, some people, uh, as to why a precious metals investment would be a worthwhile one, particularly at this time when they're thinking, I'm doing all I can to put gas in the car. Why is now a particularly good time? And we'll go from there to how small of an investment is worthwhile for someone? You know, a great question. And I think the the importance of why really comes into the fact that we have to save for ourselves, whether it's a little here, a little there, whether it's making it a plan and putting out so much a paycheck, whether it's making sure we fund our retirement account, we have to realize we are responsible for ourselves in the long run. 
<laughs> you mean that no one else is going to ride up and save us, you know, on some white steed? It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. You know, the, and anyone who's promising to do that is getting ready to take advantage of you in some form or fashion. Yeah. And so, so if, if I'm an investor, a potential investor, and I'm looking at legacy precious metals and I'm saying to myself, yeah, I, I, this sounds smart. I don't have a lot to spend. What would you tell that person? I would say, do what you can. If you never start, you never get there. So the most important step you can take is saying, I'm going to take care of myself and my family. I'm going to make it a plan. I'm going to take action. I'm going to start in the way that's comfortable for me. That's the important thing. The first step is always the hardest. But once you take that first step, the second step is easier. And then you're moving. And then once you're in motion, it's hard to stop you. So that first step, most important step. I always tell people they can call and talk to an IRA expert or, or check out the, the guide that they can download for free, the investor's guide. What, what is the number one question that you get from people who are first time investors? The biggest question I get, is this right for me? That is the question. And that comes from everyone. So, so everyone's asking the same, is this right for me? And yet we're all so unique. And, and yet it, it is a sound investment for just about any portfolio, isn't it? It is. We, even though we're all unique, that uniqueness is going to tailor the way we begin the investment. Okay. But we're all in the same situation. That's the one thing I think we seem to forget in today's society. Whether you agree with somebody or not, we're in this together. America is in this transition that we're in right now. We're dealing with the same issues. Some people like them, some don't, but we're all in it together, right? So the need is the same. How we prepare and how we invest is what changes from person to person, but we all have that same need. It's a great point. And again, I encourage people to, to, to just make the call, pick up the phone. That step is always the hardest. I'm not sure why that is in any kind of effort that you make in life, whether it's weight loss or exercise or investing some way to better your life. It always seems like that first hurdle is, is the challenge. Uh, but when they call, who, who are they going to talk to? Who, what, what's going to be on the other end of the line for them? Great question. You're, you're going to speak with one of our customer representatives and their job is not to sell you metals, right? But we have a much different approach. We're going to answer all your questions. We're going to show you what options you have. And on the rare occasion, this isn't right for you. We're going to say this probably isn't right for you. Um, we have a gold company here, but you know, I, I say it all the time. What we actually deal in is customer service. We want each and every individual that calls to get the answers they need to be able to make the decision that's right for them. And we want to do that in a way that's not pushy, that's not salesy. And that's what makes my team so special. We care about each and every caller. And we're going to show you what options you have. And then you get to make an informed decision. So don't be afraid of the phone call. It's the best thing you can do. And this is why I am so honored and I feel privileged to be sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. They're the ones that I'm going to deal with. And I encourage you to pick up the phone, give them a call, even easier. Go check out their, their guide. It's a free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. But as you said, Charles, pick up the phone. You're going to talk to someone who can answer your specific questions and get get the ball rolling, get, get started, do something that is a long-term play for your family's benefit. Charles, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always great to be here.